And good evening. Tonight we have a very special guest who it is my true honor and pleasure to have made his acquaintance. He's considered to be one of the most knowledgeable experts on the Vatican in the world, and he's going to talk about uh, tonight to us something that is both timely and relevant to many issues in the world today. Although this program tonight is not about UFOs, it's about intrigue, prophecy, geopolitics, and the New World Order. And something that's on everyone's mind as we rapidly approach the end of this century and the end of the millennium, the Millennium Endgame, a term that my guest has used to describe the tour de force of what may be happening today in this crazy world. But uh, more importantly, it's in the midst of all of this, we're going to find some events of supernatural proportions that appear to be directly linked. That is a connection uh, to the apparitions of the Virgin Mary to three young visionaries in a cove in Portugal from March, I'm sorry, from May to October 1917. And we're going to talk about that tonight and his latest book that was published, Windswept House. It's out there on the market, uh, on major bookstore shelves uh, as we speak. And it's a very interesting book. So without further ado, I want to introduce my guest tonight. He is, uh, first of all, a very eminent theologian, expert on the Catholic Church, former Jesuit and professor at the Vatican's Pontifical Biblical Institute. He's the author of the national bestsellers, Vatican, The Final Conclave, Hostage to the Devil, and the Jesuits. He was trained in theology at Louvain. There he received his doctorates in Semitic languages, archaeology, and oriental history. He subsequently studied at Oxford and at Hebrew University, University in Jerusalem. From 1958 to 1964, he served in Rome, where he was a close associate of the renowned Jesuit Cardinal Augustine B. and Pope John XXIII. He now lives in New York City. He's also an exorcist, and uh, it's my pleasure again to welcome to the program tonight Malachi Martin. Good evening, Malachi. Good evening, Michael, and thank you for those very, very kind words. Well, thank you for being on the program. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be with you, I assure you. Okay, well, we, unfortunately, an hour, we're going to have to cram a lot in here, but... Um, well, we'll do that under your, under your peerless leadership. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, first of all, what attracted me to you was the uh, book, The Keys of This Blood, which was published in 1990. That's right. You have seen, uh, in your connection to the Vatican over the years, you've seen quite a bit of uh, action, if you will. That's right. A lot of people are concerned or curious uh, in the world about the Fatima apparitions. Can you give us a brief overview of yeah, well, what happened there? Well, what happened there was that 75,000 people gathered in a field uh, on the October, uh, seven, uh, October 13, 1917. 75,000 people from all over Europe, some from the United States, but mainly from, the, from uh, Europe. And there were photographers and uh, journalists from all over Europe and the cameraman. And precisely at 12 o'clock, the sun started dancing in the sky. There's no way of denying this, because so many people saw it, and so many photographs were taken. Previously, that had been raining all day, and everybody's clothes were wet. All of a sudden, every clothes, were, every bit of clothing was dry, as if it had just come back from the cleaners, dry and fresh, and smelled beautiful. Now, this is all attested by people who don't believe in God, who have no belief in the Catholic Church. They just saw it happen. And then the sun started um, bending down as if to shoot against the crowd in all its colors and then retiring again. And this gy these gyrations went in for one quarter of an hour and then suddenly they all stopped. And the sun shone normally in its, in its zenith. And that was the end of it all. That was the miracle of Fatima. Now, the, the, the three children, there were three young children, all of them under 10 years old, who Who's up, who announced this, said that the Virgin Mary was going to appear to them on that day, not to the crowd, and she was going to make a promise to them, and she did. And she gave them three secrets. And the, the first two secrets they revealed uh, to the world, the third secret was written down on a sheet of note paper and finally sent over to the Pope in Rome in the 1950s. And it was supposed to be opened in 1960 by Pope John the Twenty-Third. And the conditions laid down in that letter, apparently the letter contained conditions laid down by the Virgin the Pope was supposed to obey. The Pope decided not to obey. And the secret then was put away and hidden. It has been read by Paul VI, Pope Paul VI. It has been read by John Paul I. It has been read by John Paul II. It's been read by Cardinal Ratzinger. I read it under privilege, and I'm under oath about it, not to reveal the exact details of it. It's not a pleasant document. It's a very unpleasant document to read. And that's where the, that's where the Fatima thing stands at the present moment. Okay, now, real quick, uh, 
What is a secret? Um, you know, we know what a secret is today, but I, I understand that the meaning of a secret in this context is a little different. Yes, it is. It means it's something which is reserved for a certain privileged people or certain people with access. It's like, uh, it's more or less what we call a secret confidential document for which you must have a clearance in the State Department, say. That's sort of a secret. Okay. Because for me, a secret is normally something known only by two people. Yeah. But this is known by hundreds. Okay, now, this particular incident, the Fatima incident, mm -hmm. the first two secrets that were divulged to these children in That's Fatima, right. Right. all of those came true. They did. They, the, the, the Virgin predicted the Second World War and the timing of it. And she also predicted, uh, or she revealed to them what hell was like. Those were the two secrets she revealed. The third secret was a description of miseries, disasters, that would take place unless certain conditions were met. The Pope of 1960, John the 23rd, refused to meet those conditions. And therefore, as they say, we are now in the, uh, in the or. It was either or. So the chastisements, these disasters predicted in the third secret, are, come, are about to be unloosed, <laughs> loosed on us all, according to the, the, the Fatima doctrine. Okay. How does this third secret of Fatima have to deal with the New World Order? Well, the third secret interpreted on its face value, without going into the details of it, implies that the New World Order now being installed, in fact, between you and me and the Holy Spirit, Michael, it is installed in its grand lines now, is definitely something that will not last and that is, uh, is uh, unacceptable to God. Uh, briefly, it means that. No. Because this new world order is built on money. It's built on the, the, the regulation of capital and the flow of capital and the flow of capital goods in the hands of... Uh, uh, an elite, uh, outside of which no country or nation can live, witness how quickly North Korea has been brought to heel, having threatened us with missiles two years ago, they're now suing for participation in trade because they're going to die. And no nation can live without participating in this new world order. And that is the genuine, that, that's the, that, that the nuts and bolts of the, gen, of the new world order. And uh, it has several organs, of course. It has the Bureau of International Settlements, composed of the, 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 the presidents of the big central banks. Mr. Greenspan is a member, for instance. But it means that, for instance, our Congress and uh, Senate and presidents, the, the, the executive and the legislative, will, be, will not be making certain decisions. They will be fulfilling certain decisions imposed on them from outside. This is one of the prices we pay. The third secret implies that this is the very opposite of the kingdom of God. Now, in 1990, you published The Keys of This Blood. And again, like I said, this is the book that kind of turned me on to you. Yes. Uh, the subtitle of this book is Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for That's Control right. of the New World Order. That's right. Uh, this stuff that you're saying, and, and of course the book, and I, again, you know, I've... I've stated that this book is a very timely uh, piece of, of current events work. You've done a very good job with it. Mm -hmm. Kind of boil this down for, for us. Uh, how does Russia and the United States and the Pope figure into this uh, grand design, if you will? Well, I'll tell you, Michael, it comes down to this, that both of them can't win. Uh, the you God that... John Paul II stands for and the Christ he's supposed to believe in and lead his people to venerate and adore and serve, uh, he cannot uh, be served by the New World Order, which is a purely human, uh, non-theistic, non-Christ-like, uh, non-Christian arrangement of the human affairs, of human affairs. And therefore there's no reconciliation. Now, John Paul II, uh, over the time, he has modified his dealings with the New World Order, and because the New World Order has progressed considerably since 1990, uh, and he, is, he has modified, it's now almost six years, he's modified his attitude and his policy towards it, but it still remains irreconcilable. Is it, is it all anti-Christian? Not much anti-Christian, it's, it's, 
it, it abstracts from Christ's salvation, it abstracts from heaven, it abstracts from morality based on revelation. For instance, you take the uh, European Union, which is, a, which is a linchpin in the New World Order. The European Union is going to be finally a monetary and financial unit. However, they achieve it by 202, 2002. Now, but there are laws there that are totally irreconcilable with Christianity as well as Catholicism, and they're imposed on all members. Some people would say, I'm, you know, listening to the program even, there's, sure. there's non-Christians and Christians listening to the program. Sure. Some people would say, well, what, you know, what is the, uh, what is the nut here? What, you know, what makes the, the Christian perspective uh, on this thing the, the accurate spin? Well, that depends on faith and belief. Actually, to, I can answer that in an indirect way, Michael, in the following way. There is no organization. I'm talking about organization as such. There is no organization parallel to the Roman Catholic Church. It has one billion, almost one billion nominal members spread over the entire world, literally. It has an organization, a responsible machinery in all those countries. True, uh, the practice of the faith by many people is, is low, but still it's there as an organization. It is very, very well run. It has an enormous diplomatic panoply. For instance, the Pope himself has 117 ambassadors from 117 countries on Vatican Hill. Now, do you think they're there just for the love of the beautiful statues? No, they're there because there's a, there's a, a value and a prestige and a power in that worldwide organization that they covet, be it to launder their money through the Vatican Bank, be it to have a neutral ground on which to discuss their affairs, as the Palestinians and the Israelis did in the past, and as we did with the Soviets in the past, and as we've done with the North Koreans, and as many people do. They also have their own, the Pope has his own representatives in 85 or 86 countries, fully fledged ambassadors. And we, the Catholic Church is an observer, an entitled observer, at the United Nations, where it has a representative, a permanent representative, and a permanent mission, and it's also in the European Union. And so it's fully recognized it's as a full political recognized. entity. It is. It's, it is a sovereign state, even though it's 110 acres, it's golf, golf, uh, a golf uh, park size, but still it is a fully recognized. It's chiefly though it's prestige, and it has a very respectable portfolio, by the way, running it at the hundreds of billions of dollars, invested in every sector of human life today industrial, uh, etc. Okay, now... So it, it, so it, is, it is a power, and uh, peop, the, the, the answer to your question is indirect, but it's an answer. Today, for instance, as regards John Paul II, there is a very strong wish on the part of many governments and many organizations and many powerful foundations, by the way, in the States and in Europe, to get John Paul II to resign. Why? Because he is not being cooperative in, say, the question of population explosion. Yeah, well, he's a thorn in the side for some of these. And therefore, they want him to resign because there are candidates for Pope who would be much more conniving, much more complacent with the modern idea of limiting populations. And why do they do that? Because if they can get a Pope who is complacent as regards the limitation of population and as regards the new system of education, the homogenization of education throughout the world, of the world which is the plan, uh, as we all know, the new educational plan, if they can get a Pope complacent in those new frameworks, then they have at their disposal this a worldwide institution sure. throughout the world. A geopolitical which, institution. Uh, exactly, and which, by the way, is a great social stabilizer. I always give people this image, Michael, and it's worth uh, giving me a moment to explain it. Supposing, supposing tomorrow morning the Catholic Church ceased to exist, no more seminaries, no more cathedrals, no more churches, no more convents, no more popes, no more bishops, no more nothing. You know what would happen to our civilization? It would collapse. Why do you say that? Because it fulfills a role, a socio-cultural role, that it can't be replaced overnight. If overnight, in the hypothesis I give you, it disappeared, there would be a big black hole. Interesting. Great chaos and confusion. Okay. It, it fulfills the world. And therefore, there's a strong desire to have them help them. This shows power. And the, the geopolitical power of the, of the papacy was never more manifested than with John Paul II. He's a...
if, if he's anything, he's a geopolitician. In fact, I would say this, and I, I know I'll be reproached, he's not a theologian, he's a geopolitician. Okay, now when we come back from this next break, I want to get into what the, uh, again, you know, the supernatural. Sure. There's a lot of weirdness around this. Uh, oh, there's a, I mean, the attempted it, assassination of him in 1981 is, I there's, think. There's, there's what they call a chillability factor in all this. Sure. It's chilling. <laughs> it is. Turning from New York is my guest tonight, Malachi Martin. He is the author of numerous books. We're talking tonight about the keys of this blood as well as his latest novel. It's a novel. Uh, windswept House, which we're going to talk about in the last segment of the program. And uh, the Windswept House, again, kind of doubles back a little bit and fleshes some of the stuff out that you find in the keys of this blood. So it's going to be a you know, real interesting uh, discussion, so stay tuned. Uh, Malachi, we've got a call. Uh, we've got a caller calling in from our affiliate in Salt Lake City, KCNR. And uh, I guess it's is it Dave? Dave? Hello. Hello, Dave? You're on the air. you got a question for my guest? I can't hear Dave. I can't hear him sure, either. I can barely hear you. Okay, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, I'll just go ahead and let it fly. I can't hear anything, but uh, I understand the UN uh, wants to go after our vehicles next. Uh, New World Order, they're very upset with the uh, mass amount of gasoline and oil and whatnot that the Americans use. Uh, and two, are they worried? Uh, about the mass population that has arms. I myself uh, possess a Tommy gun. Uh, they worried about retaliation and uh, Michael phenomenal show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Malachi, did you hear my? Uh, did you hear, hear his question? I heard some of it. Yes, I didn't quite understand the drift of the question. Well, he heard. He heard that the UN wants to take cars away from people because they're disturbed over the amounts of oil and energy that is utilized in this and uh, he's also heard that there's uh, an interest to take away the guns and I guess this all plugs into the new world order. Yes, I'm sure it does. The, well, I think we're very far from ridding Americans of that car. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to see anybody go down to Texas and try and take away their cars from the Texans. They'd be met by a hail of bullets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it's impossible. That would, it, it's not a thing. About arms, no. The, it's a long discussion and it's a long road to that. I think we're not in any danger of that. Okay. We really are not. Now, is the United Nations going to play a big part in the New World Order? Well, yes, but the United Nations will have to undergo modifications. We'll have to get uh, arresting powers, policing powers. It'll have to get military powers, too. It'll have to be delegated, but we'll have to, if it's going to fulfill really uh, what it needs. But, you see, Michael, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the United, that the New World Order is a government as, for instance, the government of Washington, the government of Paris, the government of Rome. You know what I mean? It's not a government in that sense. It, 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 it will utilize the services of all governments, of all national governments, but it will be the super regulator of all human activity because it will regulate the flow of capital and the flow of capital goods. And that's the, and of course, that, as we all know, that's the key. That is the key. You see, every day, for instance, in the major capitals, in the major stock markets, Tokyo, Singapore, New York, London, Paris, Rome, etc., there are millions and millions of investors. Millions. Like, I sound like Carl Sagan. Millions and millions. Billions and billions of tiny stars. There are only a certain amount of people who play with something between 40 and 60 billion. And, uh, as the present Pope has never stopped saying, if I have 10 men who are 10 foot tall standing in a room with 40 men who are 4 foot tall, tell me who the 10 foot men are going to talk to. Right. In other words, they're going to play themselves because they have the wealth in their hands. There's no conspiracy here. There's no plot. It's a question of great wealth centered in the hands of a few who wisely govern uh, and keep going the entire financial system of the world, which now has been globalized. If there's uh, trouble in the New York stock market, they feel it in Tokyo and vice versa and in Singapore and in, uh, uh, throughout the world. This, this sounds very much like Orwell, George Orwell, 1984. Well, it, it, well, Orwell wasn't wrong in everything, you know. <laughs> of course not. Very accurate in a lot of things. But it, there's nothing sinister about this. It simply is the amassing of power due to global communications and due to the rise of the great wealth in individuals. Now, that, of course, they have no, uh, they have no relationship whatever to religion mm -hmm. as such. And that's where the difficulty comes. Okay. Let's take another call. We've got Emmett calling in on our affiliate KHOW2 in Boulder. Uh, Emmett, do you hear me? 
Yes, I'm here. Okay, what's your question for my guest, Malachi Martin? Hey, Emmett. Hello, Malachi. Hi there, Emmett. Pleased to meet what's, you on the radio. What's on your mind? Well, plenty, actually, after uh, listening in on this conversation. Yes. Calling from Boulder, Colorado. I'm a graduate of Xavier University in Cincinnati, uh, Ohio. Uh-huh. You might be familiar with that. Yes, I am familiar with the name. Curious to find out uh, the role of the state of Israel in uh, current future events, uh, according to any biblical predictions and uh, just current events. Well, the, 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 the Bible actually doesn't talk about the state of Israel at all. It talks about the Israelites, the Jewish people, as the chosen people. And even St. Paul confirms that too. Uh, it doesn't speak about the state of Israel as we know it. In the present geopolitical configuration of the world, Israel is uh, the, the ally of the United States and is a linchpin in the foreign policy of the United States, which at the present moment is centered on the Middle East because of oil. And uh, we have, uh, the Americans, uh, we Americans have invested a huge, all our military logistics in making sure we have a presence in the Middle East that cannot be shaken. Uh, I want to talk about that, too, a little bit more. Because that's something else. But that's, that's the present function of the State of Israel. It is not in any sense biblical, uh, except in so far as the, the, the Jewish people are involved in it. Okay. We're going to take another call. Uh, we've got Joe calling in on our affiliate in Albuquerque, New Mexico, KHTL. Good evening, Joe. Hello. Hi. What's your Hi, question Joe. for my guest? Hello, I'm Malachi. Uh, it's uh, quite to talk to you. Hi, Joe. I have a question about the Antichrist. I hear all these predictions yes. that uh, he may be alive now and his yes. connections to Israel, that uh, he's uh, Jewish and uh, maybe a general. Uh, do you have any opinions on well, uh, whether the Antichrist I, 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 is actually uh, no. uh, going to be uh, taking over the world at this time? No, Joe, the, the Antichrist will not be taking over the world at this time. Why do I say that? Because we don't think he exists. The only indication we have of Antichrist is in the second letter to the Thessalonians by Paul. And he gives us a quite clear indication, three traits of Antichrist. Number one, he will be super, he will have supreme wisdom and solve all our problems. Joe, there isn't one man alive today who can solve our problems, number one. See, where well, he come forward. Number two, he will be adored as God. And number three, he will accept to be adored as God. And there's nobody like that on the horizon today. There are very shadowy figures, and uh, but there's nothing sure in it at all. Well, is, is it certain that something like that will happen or come someday? Oh, St. Paul says it will happen okay. someday, yes. Now, Malachi, let's, uh, we got about another minute in this segment. Uh, Real quick, the thing that took this, uh, the thing that brewed this, if you will, and yes. over history, yes. I, I, you know, one of the things that we hear a lot about is the money connections and, sure. and things like that. Sure. What was the connection between the money power and, say, the Bolshevik re Revolution? Well, there's no doubt about it that the, the Bolshevik Revolution needed money. Who did it get it from? Uh, the, the Germans. Were there any Americans involved in that, too? Uh no, not directly. Indirectly, there were, yes. Okay. There were. There were. But uh, money was needed by Hitler, and he got that through various means. Some of them were from Wall Street. There's no doubt about that. We, it's historical. Uh, but that was to build up Germany, which was in a, such a dreadful condition after the, after the First World War. Um, no doubt, though, that it was the, the elite that we're talking about that oh, has yes. been manipulating the, the world yes. powers, if you will. No doubt about that money was always needed. Saddam Hussein was aided, too. Mm -hmm. It's always about money. It's always about money, finally. <laughs> money. <laughs> money, money, money. <laughs> money, money, money. Unfortunately, oh, fortunately, it's, that's the way things are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. May the 13th, 1981, and of course, May 13th being the, the uh, infamous day that the apparitions of the Virgin Mary started in Portugal and at Fatima. May 13th, 1981, uh, Malachi, what happened? Well, the Pope was riding around St. Peter's Square in the middle of a crowd estimated to be just roughly 75,000 people. Uh, the Pope Mobile, as they called it, was a car constructor especially for him. He could stand up and, and wave to the people and give his blessing. At a certain moment, shots rang out. Uh, uh, there was a hitman called Mehmet Ali Aksha, a Turkish subject, who had tracked the Pope to Rome and uh, set out to kill him. He was aiming at the Pope's skull. At the moment, he sent his first two bullets out against the Pope's uh, skull.
skull casing, the Pope bent down to pick up a little child, and the bullet went over his head. But the second round of bullets hit him in the chest and felled him. And then he was in convalescence, and uh, something happened then, did it? Well, actually, he was rushed to the wrong hospital. There is a hospital close by the Vatican where the a Pope's blood is always kept. He wasn't rushed to death. He was rushed to Gemelli Hospital where they gave him tainted blood, and he proceeded to get hepatitis on top of his wounds. So he was, uh, he was uh, uh, convalescent until about the end of the year. Now, wasn't there, a, I understand that there was uh, perhaps a possibility that uh, Mary appeared to him. He had, he says, he says, he had a vision of Mary in August of that year. He was shot in May, and he was lying in hospital all that time, and he had a vision of Mary in which she repeated the, 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 the vision of Fatima, the one I described at the beginning of the program. And, and he did send for the third secret, and he, he did start reviewing it. The third secret again for the second time, and he asked the expert in, um, in the matter, she's a nun, to go over to Spain and Portugal and do some inquiries for him. Uh, that was the extent. Then when he was better, he made a pilgrimage to Fatima, and he met in the surviving... One of the surviving of the, one of the surviving of the three children, Lucia. She's now a nun, and she's in a Carmelite monastery in Coimbra, in Spain. Now, now your thesis is is that the the, the actions of this pope, of course, are extraordinary. Mm. Uh, in and of itself, he is a unique pope uh, sure. because he has done so much. He's gone so many places sure. and uh, seen by so many people. You're operating from the the, the idea that uh, there was something. In other words, he has a vision. Yes, he has uh, and a vision. This vision is divine. Yes, he hasn't communicated that to us at all. And that's creating a great confusion. Because, for instance, you know, Michael, you could ask me, um, has he lost control of his church? I repeat, I, I retort to you and to anybody, he never sought control of his church. John Bolton never tried to control his church or his bishops. I think he's more concerned with positioning. Yes much more concerned and he he has only one dream and one dream only and that is to form some sort of a unified worldwide assembly of Christians on whatever basis he can and to cluster with them all Jewish believers and all Muslim believers because he says that such a force could be loosed by believers uh, that it could solve most of the problems the socio-political and social problems that afflict mankind now let's move to your, your latest publication, Windswept House, a Vatican novel. Yes. What prompted you to write this? The fact that there is a plan implemented for the last five or six years by cardinals and bishops, cardinals very near the Pope and cardinals throughout the world in, in America as well as abroad, and bishops to have this Pope to resign on his 75th birthday. You see, every bishop, and the Pope is a bishop, should resign at the age of 75. The Pope is an exception normally. But these people want him to resign because they don't consider that he is forward-looking enough or vigorous enough or liberal enough. And uh, he, they actually happen to agree with those who think that the human population must be severely limited by artificial means and they're willing to compromise on the whole question of married priests they don't mind the idea of married priests, and some of them would like to see uh, women ordained as priests, all of which this Pope will not allow. Now, one of the things that I noted in the windswept house is that the prologue is history, the beginning of the book, yes. is most unsettling. Yes, it is. And if any of those things are true, and sometimes they say that the truth can only be told as fiction, yes. uh, and there are some names in this book that uh, have a either hauntingly frightening... Uh, <laughs> similarity to known characters. Well, let me deal with that, Michael, very forthrightly. Okay. Uh, you know, our own our own favorite American, Norman Mailer, uh, following Taylor Caldwell, that, that marvelous writer Taylor Caldwell, they invented or they 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 gave usage to a a form called faction. By that they mean real facts dressed up as fiction. So, in other words, I want to describe. Uh, I say, suppose you have a Taylor call where I want to describe the oil barons and the Kennedys in particular and the Buckleys. Then I would give them all uh, uh, pseudonyms and create a fictional novel about the reality that happened. Similarly with Winsett, I wanted to write about this plan to get the Pope to resign 
and the type of church that those who are urging him to resign would like to have. I clothed their names in fiction, gave them fictional names. 95% of the fictional names are cover real people, real cardinals, real bishops. Of course, and I'm sure this is going to disturb some people. Well, yes and no, provided that the real name isn't down, they feel they get away with this. But uh, I thought we should put down, and then of the facts or something else, the facts are trace the, the history of John Paul II as Pope since about 1990, roughly. And, but uh, it's meant to outline this plan. It's also meant to remind Roman Catholics and non-Catholics that John Paul II has left the greater questions in suspended. He doesn't solve them at all. Right. And the book ends on a note of suspense, as you probably have found out. Oh, yes, it's quite so suspenseful. That's, that's, that's why I wrote the book, uh, the wrote to Winthrop Charles. It does emphasize, though, the desirability on the part of many, the desirability of the church to be a useful socio-cultural and socio-political stabilizing factor throughout the new world order. But I don't know how that's going to be accomplished necessarily because well, there's so much anti-church sentiment or Christian... Well, but they, 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 the proponents of this say if the church makes that compromise about abortion, contraception, mm -hmm. marriage, divorce, then we all settle down. Well, yeah. <laughs> that, of course, the church will not do that, except certain leaders would like to do that. Uh, do you think, uh, just one quick question, we've got to go to another break, but wouldn't, what would you say if somebody said, well, you're just saying this uh, to stir up in a sensational way to undermine the church? How would, you, how would you answer that? Oh, Lord God. I'll tell you, Michael, if anybody wants to read my book, or read any of my books, but this book in particular, he will know that it would be impossible for somebody to write that book unless he loved this Pope and he loves his religion and has a devotion to the Virgin right. and a mm -hmm. devotion to the church. It's one has only got to read the book. Okay, enough said. Okay, uh, we're going to come back and we'll get some final thoughts and uh, uh, sure. you know, get, wrap this up. <laughs> we might okay. have to do another program on this because I wanted to get into the uh, the exorcism uh, thing too. But, yes, uh, well, we're going to have some words on that part. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure we can. You're very prolific and very articulate and uh, your, your, your speech. Talking about Windswept House, a Vatican novel that is now on the market. And I highly recommend this book as well as Keys of the Blood. If you want to get a real primer on political affairs as they have been happening in the world over the last few years, it's an incredible read. It's, uh, it's a, a, a very dense read for one thing and it's very calm. It's very, it's got a lot of, uh, information in it and it's, uh, very well researched information. Malachi, where is the what is the future of all of this? Um, we're coming up on the end of the millennium, and everybody is yes. acting strange. I guess is the best way to describe it. There is a funny. We in France, we, we all know in our bones, no matter how uh, smug we may appear to be, we all know we're in transition. And uh, since we've been talking about the Roman Catholic Church, let me say what I think is going to happen is, or what is happening is, at the present moment, this Roman Catholic Church, of which I'm a member. And a practicing priest, I say mass every day, and I hear babies, I hear confessions, and I baptize babies, and etc., etc., etc. And I'm a believer. I'm really Michael Fuddy Duddy, conservative believer. <laughs> believe me. Um, Maybe that's not so bad in light of everything that I've seen here. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, in the light of all that, hear what I say. The, this this organization. I'm talking about the visible organization, from the Pope down to this local parish priest uh, diocese. This is a Potemkin village. It's a facade. Okay. There is no longer any evangelization taking place. No. There is no longer any vibrancy. Life has gone out of the system. As well as hope. As well as hope. It, it, the system is shot. But it's a Potemkin village. still has glorious panoplies. And if the Pope comes to this country, he can expect a crowd of half a million, three quarters of a million. And they come out to see him. And to venerate him and to sort of say, God bless our Pope, and to stand in the rain at his mass as they did in Yonkers, 250,000 of them stood. I know there was some really weird energy, not weird, but I mean good energy, sure. in 93 when he was here in Denver. I know, tremendous. But! There was a considerable amount of interest that I, uh, uh, I got lots of calls from people uh, about that program asking for more, and uh, we decided to do a, a second edition of this and continue kind of where we left off last week. And uh, there was a lot more information that uh, Maliki wanted to talk about. But 
as you're well aware, one hour does not cover it so well. So tonight we're going to do it again uh, and uh, bring him back. So it is my pleasure uh, to introduce to you Malachi Martin. Good evening, Malachi. Good evening, Michael, and thank you very much for having me. It's beautiful. I'm glad you're you're back with us. And uh, before we get started, give uh, give our audience a little bit of your background. Uh, well, my background is uh, I was born in Ireland, and I was educated there until I was 18, and then I was sent abroad, and uh, I was trained in Semitic languages, Oriental art and history, and archaeology, and then. Uh, in order to be a Bible professor, professor of biblical languages in Rome, uh, where I did was stationed, and I uh, got to know three popes there. And in 1964, I left there, came over to America, and became an American citizen, and uh, settled down in New York. And I write books here and do TV and radio. Now you have written a lot of books, uh, and mm. particularly the books concerning uh, Roman Catholicism, the pet of the Vatican and that type of things. That's right. Uh, tonight, I want to kind of get off on a little bit different tangent and talk about your past experiences as an exorcist. Yes, that is a fascinating thing, and it's always fascinating for a lot of people. We must tell them beforehand, Michael, that exorcism itself and possession is uh, is not a joyous thing. It's not a happy thing. Uh, possession is a dirty, uh, insalubrious, unhealthy, mucky, unhealthy, and uh, unpleasant the situation when you come across it, but it's a necessary evil in the sense that we have to deal with it once we meet a people who are possessed. Now, I know that the uh, people in the United States, I, I for one, um, mm -hmm. being of the age that I was a young man when the famous movie The Exorcist came out in the early 70s, yes. that kind of gives us a picture. Is that an accurate picture of no, what... No, 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 it's a bit of Frankenstein uh, for a vampire uh, business. No, the it doesn't really give the essence of it, except, you know, the, the fright of seeing somebody, uh, Linda Blair's head turning around to 180 degrees and that sort of business, and people falling through glass windows. But the real, the real uh, horror, the real pain, uh, the, the, what is wrong, what, what, what hurts in, exo in possession is the presence of the evil one. I mean, you know, what happens is this, Michael, somebody comes along and says, look, I need help or their mother brings them along, or their wife, or their husband, sometimes they're lovers, sometimes it's a cop. And you say, okay, have you been examined by a psychiatrist? Yes, and they find nothing. And there's nothing physically wrong? No, doctors have given us the complete triage, and there's nothing wrong with that. Something, I, I'm tortured by the devil. I made a pact for the devil. And when we start an exorcism, within the first 20 minutes we know whether it's genuine or not. How do we know? That's what I'm trying to, the point I want to get across to you. Suddenly, it becomes evident, palpably evident, that we are all in the, the exorcist and his assistant and the possessed person. We are in the, in the presence of something that hates us in a way that you've never felt hated before. You have never felt hated before. It's like an invisible animal clawing at you with the claws you can't, you can't escape. It's a, it's, it's a palpable feeling. Then you know we have possession. Do you see any kind of physical manifestation of that? Oh, yes, there are, well, of that, not particular, no, you do. There are physical manifestations like changing temperature from freezing cold to stinking warm, stickily warm, uh, the smells, odors, objects flying around. Uh, you always make sure, if possible, that where the exorcism is done, there's nothing hanging on the walls. There's no movable, there are no movable furnished bits of furniture around the place. Uh, you always make sure of that because they're going to fly around. And then there's violence on the part of the possessed person at times. They have to be held down. That's why you have assistants, strong, burly men who have been through it before and who are not afraid and who, who have been through it. Because a lot of people, the moment they enter their first exorcism, they become incontinent. It scares them, scares their life out of them. This is a very specialized field, I, I take. Well, it's very specialized. Nobody can, nobody should should tamper with it or have anything to do with it except with permission and training. It's simply, as I said in the very beginning, it's the most unhealthy, insalubrious, mucky, dirty, inhuman activity you could participate in. But we must in order to save these people. Now, the difficulty is that many people, you know, regard. Uh, Satan or Lucifer, because that's, uh, they're two distinct beings, um, they regard them as sort of myths, 
you know, he's an old man with dirty ears and cloven hoofs and dirty books under his arm saying, come behind the curtains and masturbate with me or something, <laughs> or do something naughty. Mm -hmm. No, 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 he's a, this is a very, very, these are very, very sophisticated spirits who are there to harm us, and they're real. Fascinating. Maliki, who gets possessed? I mean, um... Well, you see, we have tried in the past, Michael, and I'm speaking about a, a career stretching over 35 years. We have tried in the past to create the profile of the possessable person, so to speak. And we have found that there's no, uh, no, there's no, no norm. For instance, neither sex, nor age, nor education, nor color, nor race, nor uh, riches or poorness, or uh, uh, intellectual degrees. Or Crosses all boundaries. It's at random, apparently random. And of course, it's random because it depends on the free will of everybody, and therefore it's 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 haphazard. There's no law. There's no rule at all. And some people are possessed uh, willingly. They set out to get possessed, uh, be possessed by Satan for one reason or another. Or others are possessed because they want something which leads them into possession. It's, uh, people approach it in a different way. We have a new, uh, since I started it in the, in the 60s, there's a new phenomenon we have noticed. More and more young people coming forward, 30-somethings, 40-somethings, because we're all old men, but there are 30s, 70s, 40s, coming forward and saying, look, I made a pact when I was 25, when I was 32, when I was 23, uh, and I want to get rid of it now. How do I get rid of it? It's, it's, it's a very frightening thing to find so many of them. Well, I know that uh, some people out there in the audience might be familiar with uh, Scott Peck's work, but uh, he wrote a book called The People of the Lie. One of the things that he said I was very uh, impressed with, and I think it's probably true, is that there has been no scientific study conducted in the psychiatric community of human evil. No, it's, 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 well, the psychiatric community, anyway, you see, has always been rather, not atheistic exactly, but it abstracts from all religion as such. What has happened to us in this particular segment of the country, the northeast corner, is that we work very closely with psychiatrists, especially the psychiatrists who deal with what we call MPDs, multiple personality disorder people. You know what I'm talking about. Right. And we, we work very closely with them, and we do, we do succeed in a healing them, healing them completely. What are the characteristics of... And I understand that multiple personality disorder can oftentimes be... Well, okay, let's back up. Let's, uh, let's yes, say this. Yes. Demonic possession, mm. is, is it misdiagnosed? It is misdiagnosed to a large extent. I have visited uh, various asylums, you know, people who are or, uh, psychiatric hospitals, and there are people inside there who will never be healed because they're not psychiatrically ill, or mentally ill, they are possessed. Can they? Okay. And I've seen the same thing in prisons. I do. I used to do a lot of work in the prisons in this area. It's the same thing. Possession is more common than you'd like to think. You think it is more common? More common than you'd like to think. In what? Okay. In what? Uh, res I guess. Uh, people. People actually are possessed by Satan or Lucifer or one of the demons. But we're not to expect them to behave like uh, uh, Linda Blair in the movie, like you said. No, no, that's that's a bit of sort of, that was, you know, Hollywood. No, this is far more frightening. And it's far more devastating. It ruins families. And then you must remember, Michael, that in this country, as in Europe, but in this country, especially since we're talking about it, there are families in which Satanism descends by bloodlines ever since the Plymouth Rock. Okay, now let's let's go here with this. Um, yes. Your when, can you compare Satanism or people that practice Satanism? Yes. Does it uh, does it always uh, cross over with demonic possession? Of course, of course it does. What is the dynamic of that? The dynamic of it is the communication of power by Satan or Lucifer or both. So, if you have someone who is uh, possibly demonically possessed, they might demonstrate uh, the ability to move furniture or... Oh, m much more effective than that, to be successful in Wall Street, to uh, succeed in business. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, no, uh, uh, Lucifer and Satan, the demons, help people to succeed in their way, provided they do their will, provided they do their, their manifest will. They, they give them power.
Okay. Over people. All right. Let's take a, let's take a call. Uh, we've got uh, Blaine calling in from our affiliate in Salt Lake City, KCNR. Good evening, Blaine. Blaine, are you there? Blaine? Blaine? Hello, Blaine. Hello? Yeah, Blaine. Can you hear me, Blaine? Uh, I can't hear you, Michael, but I'll assume I'm on the air. You are on the air, so go ahead. What's your question for my guest? Uh, I can I hear you, Blaine. I had a question about last week about his theories of cultural causation. On the one hand, he correctly pointed out how the New World Order uses techno-economics to uh, dominate the nature of our culture. Yes. And then, on the other hand, you take sort of a neo-Marxist twist, and uh, you're pointing out how Catholic ideology can have an effect on our culture. And my comment on this week's uh, episode, uh, I was wondering what you thought about the uh, relationship to the ancient shamanistic uh, exorcism of spirits as it compares to the modern. Well, the, the, from what we know about shamanism, and the activities of shamans that now exist, because we, we, can only, we can only treat with shamans that exist and not with what people say about them, but the shamans that do exist mainly are uh, relying on natural means to, to befuddle their, 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 their adherence. But there are, amongst the shamans, genuine uh, people dedicated to Satanist ritual. And in that case, we have possession. Okay, and... Uh... I was wondering if you'd comment on the cultural causation, materialism versus idealism. Well, the, there's no doubt about it that where materialism reigns and where idealism or the life of the spirit is crushed, there's no doubt about it that Satanism and Satanist rituals flourish. It's a known fact. Simply, as night follows day, or as, yes, as night follows day is the best image. Whenever there's a, a loss of spirit, a loss of religion, a loss of morals and ethics, there always is an accompanying uh, Satanist reaction. Always. Is that clear up, Blaine? Uh, yeah, sort of. Okay, well, thank you for calling. Okay, Malachi, yeah. the, we got one minute before we go to a break, but sure. Uh, sure. what uh, this site kind of dovetails into our discussion last week. Yes. Uh, the influence of uh, satanic practices, I suppose, yes. with uh, you know certain factions of political, uh, you know, crossing over political sure. lines. Sure, sure. Uh, do you? What do you think about the? And uh, save this answer for the after we come back from the sure. break. But what do you think about the connection between so-called maybe New Age uh, thoughts and uh, practices that we see so much of today? And uh, and some of this. And That's we a very important question, Michael. Okay. When we went to break, we were talking about the uh, the New Age movement. How does all this stuff uh, crosses over? Well, in very simple language, Michael. In very simple language, and it requires a lot of explanation after that. Here's the way it works. In this world of man, this cosmos, there are just two main forces: God and evil personified in Satan and Lucifer. And finally, since everything is being globalized today, evil itself is globalized. And what before was practiced by small communities and small sections of communities, small little groups, covens as we used to call them, is now becoming the way of life and the way of thought of whole populations according as their morals and ethics are completely degraded and uh, reduced to materialistic terms and hedonistic aims and totally this world uh, view of things. And that is the reign of evil and it is directly in contravention to the reign willed by God who is the sovereign creator and master of all things. So that's the situation today, this the evil is, no doubt about it, uh, more organized, more globalized, and it comes out in the new age, which is the deification of man and the creation of man's habitat as the only aim worth having, whereas this is not God's aim in this life for human beings. 
And of course, uh, as you've mentioned in the keys of this blood, uh, the uh, aim of, say, uh, Marxism mm -hmm. is a, a dialectic materialism. Sure. And it was a chapter. It's now a past chapter in the history of man. Marxism as such is a closed chapter. It was closed in 1989-1990 with the collapse of the USSR. And we've passed into another phase. Leninism is still alive. There's no doubt about that. And it's a threat. And it's going to be one of the causes of headaches for American planners in the next 10 or 20 years, if we have 10 or 20 years to go in this matter of uh, a geopolitical spiraling, because now we're approaching the point of clash between Russia, China, and the United States. Nobody else counts except those three. Yeah. Neither Islam, nor Catholicism, nor Judaism counts. It's just those three powers, and um, uh, Leninism is now is still there. But what is still strong is that which animated Leninism and Marxism, namely total materialism, the totally materialistic interpretation of human life. I'm kind of curious. The the one thing that I see, you know, as you as you know, this program deals with the paranormal and UFOs and that type of thing. Yes. I'm kind of curious how you would uh, maybe assess the situation as far as um, the interest. In, just like I said here on the July 8th copy of Newsweek, the front cover, yes. that Americans are really hooked on the paranormal. What is the catalyst or what is the, uh, what is the dynamic here? That but then that, the dynamic is this, Michael, and it's, it, we have to be terribly honest with ourselves in this matter. I don't tell who they are who he is or she is. But everyone today, if they really sit down, let their hair down, and deal grapes on this subject, we all know that deep in our bellies, we sense we're in transition. Something is changing vastly in our human scene. We don't know what it is exactly. Well, I but think that's very true, too. Something is changing. Life is no longer a continuum. We don't know the past very well. We are afraid of the future, and the present is confusing. And there's, there's, we're in change. We know that. And we don't know what's going to happen. And we, we are afraid. And then uh, overshadowing that are the various myths that we've had in the past, uh, as well as a few more that are just belonging to the future and are going to frighten us and uh, cause us a lot of nightmares. But the, the, I think that's the, kind of the the dynamic is this. It's this uncertainty. We have, it's not merely economic uncertainty. It's political uncertainty. It's the uncertainty of morals, the uncertainty about marriage, the uncertainty about uh, heterosexuality and homosexuality, the uncertainty about disease. Uh, there's a great uncertainty. We're, with all our science, with all the perfection of our methods, we are now more uncertain about basic things than we ever were before. Is that why you see maybe perhaps a, a movement toward us? Because the the institutions that we see today have uh, essentially failed in some way. They have failed. They are bankrupt. There's no doubt about they are bankrupt. And I'm a Roman Catholic priest. I'm a very faithful one. In fact, I'm a fuddy duddy Catholic priest, really. <laughs> but I know that the organization of the church, the organization, not the church itself, but the organization itself is is a, is, a, is a Potemkin village. It's a facade. It's dead. What is an organization, it's dead. Uh -huh. And I, if I, I can say that about the Protestant churches, every one of them. I can say it about Mormonism. It's dead too. It's really an organization turning over. Uh, and Islam is a different thing completely, and Judaism is a different thing completely. And they haven't got a ghost of a chance of running the world of this civilization. What's that leave? I mean, that, that leaves us high and dry, facing an uncertain uh, ocean, lapping on the shores of our land, and uh, gives us this horrible feeling that no matter what we do, we're just on a treadmill, and uh, it, the things are changing so quickly and so vastly that we are uncertain about the future, about our own selves, about our bodies, and about our minds, and about our souls, and about our children, about our families about our economics, about our money, about everything. We have great doubts, unless we drown our sorrows in drink or wine and women in song, or with foolish ideas of making a million bucks every day, which will for a while satisfy. 
And there's life. yeah, there's something deeper. And then suddenly, well, you find that you, when you've bought all you want to buy, you find suddenly that you want to buy something else, and that can come with money. But then it's usually satanist. It's some satanist satisfaction in your soul, some tin god. Okay, let's take a call. Uh, okay. Jim Jim is calling in from our affiliate KIDO in Caldwell, Idaho. Good evening, Jim. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, what's, your, what's your question for my guest? Well, I'd kind of like to know if you, what you think of the Salem witch hunts and if there's any correlation in that and the, the evil you've been talking about. Is, is that the ultimate exorcism? Well, from what we, from what we know of the Salem witch hunt and the Salem trials, there was a lot of injustice committed there. It, it wasn't done with any uh, ecclesiastical regularity at all or with any theological perception. Was that something that was maybe based in fear? It was based on fear to a large extent and ignorance. Now, there may have been Satanist activity amongst those women. There may have been. We don't know. It's very hard to know. Okay. Well, hold that, hold that thought. When we come back, we'll go into the uh, this thing that we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, we didn't talk about it on the air, but we talked about it uh, off air, yes. about the uh, this uh, perhaps a prediction, uh, something that might be coming in the next oh, yes. few months. Okay. Returning is Malachi Martin. Malachi Martin, I'm sorry. Yeah. Keep pronouncing that incorrectly. No. Adam Michael, what's in the name? <laughs> really, it's the information that's important. Right. Yeah, uh, we have a caller calling in from our affiliate in Lakewood, Colorado, on KHOW2. His name is Brad. Good evening, Brad. Brad? Hello? Hello? Br Brad, you're on the air. <laughs> what's your uh, question for my guest? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can Brad. hear you fine. Fine. Brad? Yes. Turn your radio down. You'll need to turn oh, okay. that down. Okay, I've got it down. Um, okay, go ahead. I've got a, a two-part question. Okay, Brad, go ahead. Uh, the first one would be, uh, for my own edification, a, a definition of the difference between Satan and Lucifer. Okay. And the second part of it, of it would be the origin of evil, i.e., has it existed as long as, say, God and, and the spirits of light or good, or was that yes. something that was a manifest from the original creation and God's creation? Yes. Well, the difference between Satan and Lucifer is this, that Satan is always represented uh, as uh, a snake. Lucifer is a scorpion. They have two different functions. We only spirits which have no bodies, and Lucifer and Satan have, no, haven't got bodies, are only distinguishable by their functions. And Satan's main function is to kill, to liquidate. Uh, Lucifer's main aim is to deceive. He's the liar. So there are two separate entities. Two separate entities, yes. The beginning of it all started off when uh, there was a revolt by angels. One third of the angels created by God revolted and said, we will not serve, led by Lucifer and Satan. That was the beginning of it. Then when man was created, they started taking part in man's uh, universe and trying to seduce him away from God, as it is in the Bible. That's the origin of evil. And, of course, the, the, it still goes on. It goes on every day. They, they, they were created for this cosmos, and they intend to keep acting in it until the final day when this cosmos will be wiped out, and they will have to descend and live in hell forever. Now, last week, we yes. discussed the uh, supernatural events surrounding uh, the present Pope, John Paul yes. II. Yes. I understand that there is, uh, there is something that is supposed to happen possibly soon. Can you elaborate yes, for us? Yes, the, 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 there's no doubt about it that if I were, if I were disposed to sort of uh, prophesy in the, in the loose sense of the word, Michael, I would say, oh, I'd keep your eyes on the skies the saying goes, from this autumn, 96, until late spring, 1997, just about the time, which is June 30, actually, just about the time that Hong Kong reverts to the Chinese. There's no, no, no direct connection with that, but in that period of time, we would be very surprised if there weren't some astounding happening in the, in the cosmos affecting every man, woman, and child on this earth. Do you have a feel of what it could be? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of interest today in comets. Well, no, it's not that. Okay. It, no, this is something else. It's not physical. 
it will have a physical manifestation, but it's a, it will be an, a, a putting on notice of everybody where they stand as regards God. Could that be something equivalent to what happened in Fatima in 1917? It will be something equivalent to it. It's a consequence of it, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be, it's going to fulfill all the things predicted at Fatima in 1917. But it's primarily going to be a putting on notice. People will know exactly where they stand. Nobody will be converted. Nobody's going to get faith out of it. But there... they will know where they stand. Uh, oh, that's wild. Yeah, it is wild. Well, and it'll be something permanent. They will always have that in front of them from then on. Uh, but they will know. Everybody will know. Wherever they are, in whatever language, in whatever climate. What do you think the future of uh, politics are? The future of politics, we're making plans for the President Obama now to, to re-elect, to elect or uh, that was a Freudian slip to re-elect president, to make uh, choose a president in November, all right? And apparently Mr. Dole and Mr. Clinton are the candidates of uh, Mr. Perot. But anyway, uh, we're, we are acting as, as politics as usual, and we have to. And we're all making investments. And if we have children, we're investing in their future, sending them to college. We have to do that. But politics as such, the national politics of each country, is is practically at the term, uh, at its end. And it's one of the things we all sense, too, that uh, nationalistic politics, such as we have practiced, the nation state as such, is coming to its end. And doubtless, the young people, I'm 75, so I don't reckon myself there, but the younger people, the 20-somethings, the 30-somethings, perhaps the 40-somethings, will live the day when major decisions about our money and about our education about our religion are not made uh, by the Senate or the Congress or the Presidency. They're made outside by other agents. This is uh, the New World Order. The New World Order. Already big decisions are being made that we have nothing to do with. We just obey. And uh, it's coming, there's no doubt about it. But so politics, as usual, is slowly but surely being squeezed out completely. <laughs> I know that we've talked about this also last week, but what do you see as far as the, the major players in the New World Order? The major players in the New World Order, it's, they can be reduced very, very simply, really. You have the three great economic powers at the present moment, the three vying for power. You have the, US, the, the USA, and you have China. China is our big problem. What to do with China? Over 1.2 billion people? They can learn anything that we invent and do it better than we do it. They're utterly atheistic. They have no God. They were never Christian or Jewish. They're a smattering of Buddhism, a smattering of, of Hinduism, a smattering of Zen and things like that, but no formal religion as such in their culture deep. And um, then there is Russia. Will Russia pull out of its tailspin at the present moment because it's in a tailspin? It's a country run by clans and tribes and gangs. Uh, will it build itself up to be something? It still has nuclear missiles, by the way. It still has ten secret cities manufacturing nuclear weapons. It still has uh, 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 an army. It still has a KGB called by another name, a secret police, with spies all over the world. That still exists. It still has prison camps. Well, just because it changes its face, which is something that I kind of feel myself uh, yes. is happening, yes. doesn't mean that the that the poison isn't still there no, or the still acting. Is gone. You have Europe then trying to forge a unity between these seventeen about seventeen countries, and the European Union is not going to go very far. It'll be dominated by the USA and by Russia. But they're, they're the main geopolitical pawns at work here. The the bishops the knights and the bishops and the king, the kings that will run this system, are men and some women, but mainly men of great wealth. And they are the players, for instance, in the, in the BIS, the Bureau of International Settlements in Basel, which is composed of all the heads of all the central banks in the major uh, industrial countries. And these people, together with others, decide the flow of capital and the flow of capital goods, without which no nation can live today. One thing I'd like to, to say here is that uh, 
All of these statements that you've made, you know, they're very heavy statements, and of course they, sure. they hold serious implications for, sure. for our future. Sure. These statements you're making are verifiable. Every one of them I mean, are verifiable. these are factual statements that have to do with what's really happening out there today. Yeah, they're all verifiable. For instance, do you know, for instance, that uh, President Clinton is great friends with a man called, uh, uh, who's the head of the National Urban League? Uh, what's his name? Vernon... Um, He's just written up today in the New York Times. I didn't see it. And um, Bill Clinton has, uh, previous to becoming president, joined the Bilderbergers. And we hear a lot of this stuff uh, around today, a lot of this yeah. discussion about I mean, this. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, but the, the main, the people who really make decisions are people belonging to any and every country. Their chief qualification is that they come out of money. And that's the name of the game. That's the name of the game. Okay. Hold, hold, hold that thought. We're going to go back to, uh, we got to go to break. When we come back, we'll get some closing comments from our guest, Malachi Martin. Of course, his book is Windswept House. It's out on the market now. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a novel, but uh, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. And as they say, well, sometimes only fiction can be told, or only truth can be told as fiction. Before we go to the uh, final closing comments, Malachi, I want to just say that probably, I, I, I think you've probably been one of the most fascinating guests I've ever had on the program. Thank um, you very much, Michael. There's a lot of meat here, and I, I like that, and I think uh, our audience does as well because of the, it's evidenced by the calls that we received last week Good. after the program. So uh, closing comments here, we've got uh, roughly one minute. What is the... Uh, well, the, the closing comment really to make, Michael, is this, that if anybody has any coin of faith in their pockets, let them take it out and polish it up. I'm speaking to Americans, not my fellow Americans, because... You know, uh, we have a thing here called in America, which is America's civic faith. Uh, we try to supply moral purposes for public policy and moral virtues for democratic citizens as a civil religion. But it hasn't been enough. It, hasn't, it doesn't suffice. It is not enough. We need religion as such. We need to be on our knees in front of our creator. And we need to acknowledge him. As James Madison said, as, as, as.